Okay, hold on. Okay. That's oh, better. there we go. That's better. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> wow. Hello. You you look like the consummate professional and I look like a bum. Get the kids and <laughs> the thing and oh my god. Yeah. All right. Okay. All right. Let's do this, as they say. Let's do this. And I, okay. I got my, I, my, 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 uh, my my glass of water, so or my cup of water. So well, oh, here you go. Look at cool. that. Cheers. That's cool. Cheers. <laughs> All right, everyone. Welcome to episode twenty-seven of the Jikundo Dialogues with Diana Lee and Asano. I only have nine pages of, of notes. <laughs> Do you really? I only have nine oh, notes, all right? Okay, so my guest today, guys, is an award-winning filmmaker and only her closest intimates will know that she was once known as America's new Wing Chun. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, wow. Right? That's, that's a heavy okay. to follow. <laughs> Diana and Asano, welcome to the Jeet Kune Do Dialogues. Thank you. Thank you, Dwight. Oh so, my gosh. Okay, so listen to this, right? Listen to this, guys. 2011, American, uh, Asian American Justice Center presented the American Courage Award. Oh my gosh, yes. Uh, Action on Film International Film Festival presented the Maverick Award. Yeah. I, Two, yeah. 2008, I'm reminding you of your history. The 2008 LA Film Filmmaker Award, let's see, Best Feature Writer. Yeah. Yeah, that was, yeah, that was, that was cool. That was yeah. cool. <laughs> Those are all oh, cool moments. Oh, no, it keeps going. <laughs> 2008, um, New Jersey International Film Festival Best Screenplay, and 2008, Philadelphia Asian American Film Festival Honorable Mention. Yes. Yeah. My gosh, aren't you tired? <laughs> you know, um, I am, <laughs> but uh, it was worth uh, those, those moments and all the steps that it took to get me uh, to that place to where yeah. the work you recognize. Honestly, I, um, it was worth it, you know, yeah. um, because I had at the time wrote a film called The Sensei, which is going to be rebooted again under a new, um, uh, a new company. And, uh, and I think uh, it's timely uh, because yes. of the message. Yeah. Well, you know? we'll, we'll, we'll get to that because okay. I wanted to talk to you about, so yesterday, Man at Arms premiered, correct? Yes, yes, yeah. yeah. yeah I'm excited. I'm excited. Yeah. <laughs> I was on last night's premiere, but I it, 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 but I will be on on October 18th, right? And then the finale, uh, December 13th, with Robert Rodriguez, who I love, who's one of my heroes, and of course Danny Trejo is the host of yes. of Man at Arms, uh, Art of Old. Uh, okay, all right. So that's one that's one current project, and then there is something called way of the cowboy now i tried to find information on it but i couldn't because it's in development right it's in development although nbc news covered it um, okay. and uh the hollywood reporter uh covered it so if you look under in El santo dallas cowboys it should come up through the search engines right away okay but there's also something called man at arms in development is that associated with you guys that's still probably the Man at Arms Art of uh, Art of War show. That's that was what you were talking. You were just discussing that premiered last night on uh, the El Rey Network. Actually, okay, okay, this is network. So this one I didn't know about. <laughs> Alita Battle Angel. Yes, yes. Oh Alita my God! Did you see the trailer? Yes. Isn't that cool? It's amazing. I was like, isn't that sick? It, okay, so, so so listen, so listen. Of course, your and 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 hubby's involvement is a reason to watch it. But what do you think it would be my primary reason for watching this? Or what would be your or primary who? reason? 
Who do you think would be my primary reason? I, I, I don't know. You have to tell me. You Jennifer to... Connelly. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. She's oh. Cool. Yeah. Doesn't she look menacing in this? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. it's, a great, it's a great cast. So yeah. I, I'm very curious. I, I, I can't wait. Um, and it was it was really cool that you know that uh, we we got a chance. Ron and I both got a chance uh, to to work on this. And mm -hmm. uh, uh, Rosa Salazar was um, just a true delight and so dedicated. And and Keith Cook, by the way, I had to you know honorable mention to Keith Cook because he was also one another third martial artist. And we were all kind of hitting her on on a whole different spectrum of martial arts training. And yeah. Um, and then my father had worked with, oh gosh, one of the producers uh, through Book of Eli, actually, with, with you know, Denzel Washington. So they were kind of familiar with the Inno Santo name. I guess one of the producers had brought up my name or something. At least that's what he told me. And, okay. And, uh, so that's kind of how we all kind of came together on the project. And then um, another uh, colleague of mine named Garrett Warren, who's a, a stunt coordinator also, uh, called me up because he thought it, it, it might be good that Rosa, you know, gets to really see a, a female martial artist. Yeah. And, and, and yeah, cause not most of the time when you do see these action films, you know, I mean, 90% of the action world in Hollywood is driven by men. So it's kind of, even though there are stunt women, it's kind of rare to see, you know, for other actresses, I guess, really feel the energy of other women, female energy. And yeah. so, Kind of cool to, to work well, on yeah. that. Yeah, um, but now you just touched on something there, that whole 90% thing. So what is a key and or a secret to your longevity in an oh. arena dominated by males? To longevity, that's, that's a hard one because I'm always fighting the good fight. It's been yeah. hard for me, it's not been, it's not been easy. Um, you know, and, I, and I'm saying across the board, um, you know, there's this stereotype, and I do call it a stereotype that um, Hollywood is liberal. It, to be honest with you, no, it's not. I mean, uh, it's funny. I have one of my dad's students from across the other side of the country, like, try to tell me or school me that things are great for women. And I'm like, you know, especially in Hollywood, I'm like, no, dude, you obviously don't work in this industry because if you look at the IMDb, right. I can see that you didn't have a history uh, working in Hollywood, but um, the numbers still are, are, are far from being where they should be. I mean, it's sad that you have men and women in film school and it, the ratio is usually 50-50. But when it comes to working in this industry, all of a sudden those numbers get diminished. When I did the Sensei, you know, which was an indie film, it wasn't even a studio film, and I was one of 7% of women that had directed a movie, a feature film that year. Wow. I mean, the terrible, terrible numbers. And it's, you know, Hollywood with the whole Me Too movement is trying supposedly to, you know, figure this one out. And mm -hmm. I, I, I hope the industry does. Yeah. Um, I think if, for the reason why maybe I've had some longevity is that I've learned to adapt, which is something I've learned from dad quite a bit. And so um, I know how to teach, I know how to train. You know, I was a stunt woman for many years. Um, and then I, I forced myself to learn directing and producing and writing. Uh, and, and, and to be honest with you, I had my dad's sister, Lilia, yes. was her name, she had already, even before I even entered the industry, had, uh, she knew my love was uh, the arts. And so she, was really good about uh, guiding me to, you know, to, to learn under different um, uh, Broadway people about uh, character development and in the process of acting and what it is to tell a story and to express yourself as an artist. So I was lucky between her and my dad that I, I've kind of a blended this philosophy. And so I just learned across the spectrum to, to work at different departments so that I could be flexible to kind of, tune in to whatever that meant. Is that, always, is that always the direction in which you go? Stunt work to acting to directing to producing? Or, or has anybody ever done it any other way? Oh, they're different, different ways. And I actually started off as an actress. I did, uh, back going back in the 80s, I was going out on auditions. But at that particular time, when it came to casting for women and minorities, yeah. there just wasn't a lot of work. And we didn't have the kind of cable channels you have or the you know, Apple TV, Hulu, that's all, that's, 
that system is very young right now. You mm -hmm. know, it's, to be honest with you, in its infancy. So, you know, when I was going out, you're looking at maybe four networks, ABC, NBC, CBS, and Fox, and, right. you know, some cable, but it was just, and feature films or commercials, and it was just hard to, to find work for my type being, you know, uh, you know, mixed in multiracial. Yeah. And, but somebody said, God, you know, cause um, somebody had seen me move or do martial arts and they're like, have you ever thought of being a stunt woman? And, and I'm like, no, and and then I learned that you know stunt people are in the same union as actors, and right. so I said hmm, maybe this is something I should pursue. So you and never thought you never thought initially of stunt work. I mean, what with Jeff Amato being around and 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 those not, days, not like anybody was opening at the doors for me and I said, hey, you know, it, it just so happened I was working as an extra of all things on Demolition Men, and yeah. I ran into a lot of which was was. Uh, uh, Sylvester Stallone and Wesley Snipes and at that time a lot of my dad's students were working or, or you know as stunt people on that show yeah. Yeah. and they kind of like what are you doing are you doing stunts I'm like no I'm just an extra you know right and I was you know and I was <laughs> in college and um and they're like how come you're not doing this work and I I saw them do a fight scene was I was standing by and I'm like Oh my God, I could do that. I could do that. Oh my God, I could do way more than that, you right. know? Yeah. <laughs> um, and it was just so, it's just kind of funny, but I still, even then, didn't know quite how to get in because it's not like no, anybody, nobody was opening the doors for me. But when Ron and I started dating, um, Ron Balicki, for all you folks that don't know who my husband is. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Uh, the two percent of people who don't know. <laughs> Uh, my honey and I, when we were dating, um, we were engaged, uh, he was working on a movie called Barbed Wire, and he happened to be uh, training Tamora Morrison, and there would happen to be this meeting with the producers, and they were trying to run the fight scene, and I guess one of the guys wasn't quite getting it, and they had to call me in to demonstrate this, and I ran through the fight scene several times, and when I had to go on a bathroom break, the producers all met with Ron and said, do you think Diana would, you know, maybe we can change the role from a man to a woman and she can come aboard and we'll cast her, you know, and wow. that's how it all happened for me. Yeah. And then um, the next big uh, opening for me as a stunt woman was Buffy uh, the Vampire Slayer. Yeah. And I got off with that too. And, and at the time, um, it was to do a presentation piece. It wasn't even greenlit to be a show. And um, I remember getting this call about like, do you want to do this show about a teenage girl who kills vampires? I'm like, who's going to watch that, right? Well, boy, was I so wrong. And yeah. the rest was history. Yeah. Um, we, we didn't mention one of your current uh, projects, the, um, the Filipino World War II uh, vet Congressional Gold Medal. Yeah, the Congressional Gold Medal. Yeah, um, yeah uh, for people watching this, uh, two yeah two years back and uh, for filipino history month in october I, I was invited to the white house with other filipino american leaders i'm like i'm a filipino american leader yes you are <laughs> i never looked at myself as a filipino american leader but, <laughs> but i apparently got invited and i kept thinking the whole time there's a mistake there's a mistake there, you know because the people i was with were really impressive. I mean, yeah. oh my God, they were so impressive. But I went and we were hearing about all the issues that were going on in the community. And one of them being the getting getting the Congressional Gold Medal Act for Filipino World War II vets signed. Because at that time, Congress still had to vote on it. And it was uh, in the hands of, I think it was six to seven key Republicans. Mm -hmm. And um, a lot of the people, when I was at the White House, of course, it was the, during the Obama administration, were, um, were all pretty much Democrats. And they're like, how do we start this campaign to really get, you know, the other Republicans on board with this? And I go, I know a lot of Republicans because, you know, as you and I both know, the martial arts industry can be quite conservative and and so um i knew people to reach out to um and one of them was at the time was a june Ree who played a pivotal role and um he you know his relationship with washington dc went all the way back to the 60s and the 70s when right. he came to the right. country yeah and so um he got on the phone like he was you know he knew how to reach out to you know senators and uh, 
he's good friends with the Bushes, President, uh, the first George Bush, and, um, and then I knew some other people, and, you know, it was cool. It was a bipartisan bill, and it, it passed, and, man, I, I'm just so grateful because it's taken so long. It's been um, decades. Um, yeah. Honestly, our vets should have been taken care of a long time ago. A lot of broken promises over and over. Um, we have about probably 17,000 maybe surviving World War II vets still. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I'm just glad that we now get to honor them. And my, my, my own cousin, Susan, we were just at an event in New York and we were paying tribute to her grandfather who was a guerrilla fighter. And it was, it was cool. And Gen General Taguba was there. Mm -hmm. And uh, that, that was a real important project, you know. And, and Cold Steel's participation in this? Yes, so it's so beautiful. Uh, Ron approached uh, the president of Cold Steel International, which was Lynn Thompson, about how can we help take care of a lot of these vets who are living very humbly. And so they are, uh, they've been in development, in development of a commemorative bolo, which was you know, the favorite weapon to use for a lot of our Filipino World War II vets. Yeah. So hopefully, I'm like praying that it's gonna come out during the holiday season, but uh, the proceeds from the sale of the commemorative bolo will help these vets. All right, sweet. Yeah. So one, one of the things that I came across in doing my extensive research on you, was uh, <laughs> I think it was I think it was a website, um, at home in Hollywood.com. I think is what it was. At home in Hollywood.com. Yeah, I think that's what it was. So, okay. so that's my question: How does a person ever feel at home in that crazy place? <laughs> I have no idea because you think about it, especially if people are filming on location, it's like being a gypsy, you know, <laughs> one location to another. Um, in fact, you know, I would say probably in the last 10 years, so much work has gone out of the country. You know, Ron, I'm sure when you interviewed him, I mean, he was going to Romania, he was going mm -hmm. to the Philippines. Um, yeah. You know, um, I, I, yeah, I wanted to ask you about that because I mean, on the surface, it seems as if there's so much work out there, but is, is that, a, I mean, is there enough work for everybody or because you hear about stuff being filmed up in Canada and, and, and what have you. So what is the real deal? Uh, that's a really good question. Um, there is work. I wouldn't say for everybody because it depends on where you live, if you're brought in as a local. So for instance, I remember when, um, this is what was it early, um, oh my gosh, um, Resident Evil 2, for instance. We, Ron and I, we, we were training Mila Jovovich, and especially Ron, he put in a lot of moms training her, but we were both stunned. It was the first time when we started realizing work going out of the country and they were gonna film it in Canada. And I thought, Oh, great. Um, I hope Ron gets to go um, because a lot of the, even the choreography, the, the training, you know, Philippine martial arts. Yeah. This is what she knew and, and they weren't going to take him. I was stunned. And they had to kind of hand it over to the Canadians. And, um, and this is the same story that plays out like in Australia, New Zealand, England, mm -hmm. uh, that the way the system is now is, a country will say, hey, Hollywood, we would love for you to film here, and we are going to offer you this deal of tax incentives right. and all, all this, but the deal is, is in, in order for you to basically film here, and we'll, we will get you a lot of things that you need to make a movie, but you have to hire our people. Yeah. Or, the, or, or like I was told, like a, a statistic, like a ratio, like for every American, like in Australia, a, a production may hire, you know, they have to hire like, you know, five to 10, uh, you know, Australians. I mean, they, they are very strict about uh, protecting, uh, other countries are very strict about protecting their people, you mm -hmm. know, that the deal is solid. So that's why it's, in, in, in every country has its own deal and goes through its own um, evolution. Right. Um, so it's, 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 it was very tough for a lot of people in Hollywood. And then certain states here um, so decided to kind of create their own program to attract business. So Louisiana separately started kind of 
you know, getting pe getting into the game. Uh, New Mexico, New York, yeah. New Georgia, Georgia, no, right? And yeah. you know, Georgia, uh, uh, um, North Carolina. I mean, I I was stunned how the work was starting to spread in states um, that were, you know, basically offering certain incentives. Mm -hmm. and so it's 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 quite competitive, I have to say. You know, unless you know somebody, your networks are really strong. Yeah. Um, on on that question of competitiveness, um, I mean, within our martial art family, we've got Jeff Imada, Suyoshi Abe, Jonathan Eusebio, Chad Stahelski, uh, Keith you. Davis, um, Mike Lucatis, Ron Balicki. I mean, we've got a ton of people. Is there competition among them or... Really? <laughs> oh yeah! <laughs> Absolutely, there is. Uh, you know, um, and also too, it, it's who you know, the friendships people have created. But yeah, um, yeah. yeah, absolutely, there is. Um, oh my god! You know but you know, at the same time, even though there is that competition, there's a part of you that feels a certain level of, of pride. It, it's it's so funny. Like I, when I was working on Man at Arms. Um, Man at Arms is very similar to Forged in Fire, right? Mm -hmm. um, but their whole approach is also talking about how weapons are used in pop culture. And so I remember the question came up about, you know, sword work or favorite fight scene. But, you know, some of the work I've seen comes from a lot of what, you know, my dad has left through his students. So I see this thread of my dad's teaching yeah. and work. Uh, you know, embodied in Chad and David and Damon and my my husband and Siyoshi and, and of course Jeff and all these people and you can't help but feel some level of pride, you know? Right. Yes. So yeah, even though there's competition you go, God, I would love to get that job. Yeah. But on the other hand, um, you you know, I I'm I'm very proud that, and happy. that's that's the same pride that Auntie Tanya was talking about just an hour ago. You interviewed Effie Tanya. Yeah. yeah. Tanya, I hope you guys listened to her interview because she was my role model as a, a young girl. She was my first female real life role model. Yeah. Uh, I, I mentioned that to her and I asked her who were her female um, role models. And in martial art, she said Malia de Cascos. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Sure. Right? Yeah. Amazing. With, so, so here's, here's the funny thing. I worked with Mark the Cascos. <gasps> yeah. <this is> right. <laughs> way, way. John Wick, too. He's going to be the next John Wick 3, by the way. Did you know that? No. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Good. <laughs> yeah. Well, listen, I'll tell you something. Here, so here's my claim to fame with a John Wick connection. Do you know what um, Quora.com is? I have seen Quora.com, yes. yes. So I answered a question about the martial arts styles used in John Wick. Okay. And so I said, well, you got to look at the people involved in the martial art choreography. So then I talked about David Leach and about Chad Stahelski and what have you. My answer on Quora is the most popular. All right. I love it. I love it. I love it. All right. Yeah. Love yeah. It. And then you got John Eusebio who did Black Panther. Oh my God. You know, yeah. it, was, it was just, it was amazing. You know? Yes. Yeah. Um, you are, you are a lifelong Angelino, correct? Yes, I am. So when did you become aware that LA was a unique place in the world? Oh, that's a good question. A unique place. Um, unique as in the movie industry, unique as in culture. Well, see, see, this is the thing, right? Because what I really want to know is what are the major differences that you have seen in Los Angeles in your lifetime? Let's say in, forget martial art, um, public schooling. Hmm. Um, you know? Well, outside of the horrible traffic, <laughs> um, you know, I was going to say, it's so funny, it's actually interesting that you bring this up because Ron was raised in Chicago and, it, and that's an integrated city, but yet I still, I still felt that there was 
tribal and racial problems, classism, you know what I mean? Just d different, um, just issues, even though it was, you're aware there's all these people. Yeah. Whereas LA, at least the neighborhood that I grew up, I felt it was much more, uh, we were much more integrated spiritually with each other. Does that make sense? That's, um, a, you, know, you, know, you know what? I asked Auntie Tanya about the differences between Hawaiian Filipino and California Filipino, and she mentioned something about the spirituality. Yeah, yeah, I, I know what she's talking about. Um, and so for me, like I grew up uh, in Carson, California, born, born in Torrance, and I was raised in Carson as a little girl, and then later we moved to the city, which was, you know, a couple of miles away, Harbor City. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, and it's interesting for me, because of my age, I saw the transition of Carson at the time was an all white neighborhood. And then you had in, in what they say in history books is called the white flight. All of a sudden you had a lot of white families leaving. And then it seemed, you know, um, within one or two years, the neighborhood became people of color. So you, and, or mixed couples like my parents, you know, yeah. and, um, you know, it, it was fascinating for me to grow up in this global village, in my opinion, I feel it benefited me. And, and not to mention the martial arts, uh, my dad and with Uncle Bruce and, and all these other Uncle Uncle Richard, it to me um, was like slowly becoming the Mecca of martial arts. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and so I feel that benefited my outlook in life and, and how to be uh, warm, you know, receptive. And I've always had warm feelings um, with, with other cultures. Yeah. And so I feel you know, you know, they say it takes a village to raise a child. Well, my village was very international. It was, it was white, black, Asian, Hispanic, you know, you name it, uh, you know, Jewish, Muslim, Christian, I, I, and Buddhist. And, and so I feel lucky that it kind of naturally fell that way for mm -hmm. me. And, um, it, and it was really, it wasn't until I became an adult that I was aware that I was like in Hollywood. Uh, yeah. Uh, there was growth to to be made, if I can say that. Is know? is it um is it only then if you are in Los Angeles and involved in Hollywood that you have to be a hustler? You definitely need to be a go getter. You can't be shy. I mean, right. even if you feel shy, you have to um, make the steps to reach over and say, "Hi, I'm so and so," and and, and network with people. And, and in this day and age, in a way, you have to be able to wear different hats um, yeah. and kind of make your, your own way uh, in the world. Like, and that's part of the reason why I decided to try to produce and direct and write because I wanted to make my own projects and I wasn't seeing the projects that um, I would like to see um, mm -hmm. out there, you know? And that's why I made the Sensei and that's why I was, I pitched so hard Way of the Cowboy because especially right now with everything going on um, with, the, with the NFL and uh, what's happening with the, the conversation about race in this country. The beautiful thing about my father and what he was able to accomplish in the 1970s with Dr. Bob Ward, who was one yeah. of um, his dear friends. In fact, all the Ward brothers were like these, I call them spiritual brothers to my dad because they went, all went to college together. And the fact that the cowboys brought in my father and took a chance and some of them weren't all on board with this they were nervous mm -hmm. about this program yeah. to take a chance and to let my dad teach something so esoteric as martial arts to the dallas cowboys and even my dad at first thought dr bob ward was a little you know had a little bit too much texas son you know <laughs> like, you want me to do what bob you want me to teach martial arts to the cowboys what do you mean that, yeah. what, but, and Dr. Bob's like, yeah, no, trust me, trust me, it's gonna work, you know. Wow. Wow. And, um, but and and it did work. And um, you know, when I I'm, I'm actually working on a book to to supplement the the movie as well because I'm you know the movie is only going to be a, a two hour platform. Yeah. Um, so I want people to understand other things that were going on in the background because you you know when you're doing a movie you can only allow for for so many characters. It'd be yeah. different if it was you know, an actual TV series, you know, and you could gr you know, grow these characters, but when you have a two hour platform, you're reduced to making it, uh, getting to the heart of who were the main characters. Just, uh, 
Just so you know, question number 22 yes. was any book writing plans? Yes, yes. So yeah, I'm working on the book. So okay. Also with this movie, they're going to go, how, well, how come Richard Bastille wasn't there? Well, how come Larry isn't there? Or how come, and it's hard to put yeah. you know, all this information into oh. our, so. And not to interrupt, but 22A is helping your dad write a book? <laughs> I'm sorry, that almost went out my nose. Wait. <laughs> you know people ask me this. You try to tell my dad. I've my dad this for years. Maybe I will. Yeah, I'm trying to work on it. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um when when you when you're asked to um when you're asked to work with uh, a Mila Jovovich, uh, a Rosa Salazar, um, what's the what's the process? I mean, where do you start? Well, um, for me, and really, I was training. Well, no, Aaron Eckhart too, but Aaron was already this natural athlete. Um, mm -hmm. I started to realizing a system when I was training Melissa McCarthy for the movie Spy. I don't know if you ever saw that. It was great comedy. Just really well internationally. Um, she's the best Sean Spice. She's a better Sean Spicer than Sean Spice. Oh, right? <laughs> <laughs> she's hysterical. But yeah, so when I got the gig uh, to to train her and prepare her for her fight scenes, I already knew the. the I had been contacted uh, by a, a wonderful stunt coordinator named JJ Perry, and he said, "Listen, I'm in Hungary." Uh, we got to do this movie because spy, blah, blah, blah. But Melissa's doing her TV show and we got to get her up to speed and train her to look good for this fight scene. Can you train her? And, and originally they wanted Ron, but then Ron goes, I'm not going to be around, but it would be again, great to have a woman. And JJ's right. like, Oh yeah, let's yeah. get to her. Yeah. So, um, yeah. I, I took a, a, a page from Dr. Bob Ward's, again, Dr. Bob Ward is the conditioning coach and sports and original sports scientist, uh, for the Cowboys. But, I started analyzing and looking into Melissa's background about, you know, what kind of sports she might have participated in. So one of them was, was tennis. The other sport that she did was cheerleading. And then I had noticed, you know, when I watched her on TV that she was very physical anyhow. Mm -hmm. So I knew she had natural attributes. And so it was important in the short time frame that I was given, because I was not given a lot of time with her like I was with Erin Eckhart. Um, I basically you know, had to help uh, piggyback on the movements that she was familiar with. So as a previous tennis player that she was, right. you know, I started using terminology like a tennis player yeah. and then said, but this is now let's incorporate this and make this look more aggressive and this and that. And before you knew it, it made sense to tap into her muscle memory. Mm -hmm. And then the, the, um, so the training went much faster versus traditional you know, versus doing this more traditional process because it would not have gotten her uh, across the finish line to, to be ready to do her fight scenes if had yeah. I done the traditional route. It just would not have. Do you think that somebody who is trained in one martial art method would have, would they necessarily have a harder time doing what you do? Sometimes they can. It just depends um, if, number one, mentally, if they're open-minded to, to listen. Because sometimes they're just kind of just stuck in their own ways and they have mm -hmm. their own sense. And then sometimes you can just see the body mechanics. There, that there's so much muscle memory in that one way of movement. And it takes a little bit of time. So it, each individual is different. You know? Yeah. Um, okay. So I'm going to play a, a little game with you here. Um, when I was on the set of Only the Strong, when I when I when we got the call and I got the gig, um, yeah. I called Burton Richardson because he was doing movies at the time. Right. And I called your dad also to ask him, "What do I do?" You know. Yeah. And of course, your dad said, "Well, you know, just be nice to everybody and whatever." Right. Right. But Bert said, "Take an equipment bag because there's going to be a lot of downtime." So you could as well train while you're there. Okay. Right? Okay. So we did that. But one of the things that I did, I walked around the set asking different people to finish this sentence. So I'm going to do it with you. Okay. Okay. So <laughs> all production assistants really want to be. 
respected. Oh, okay. All stunt people really want to be uh, healthy, meaning don't walk away broken bones. <laughs> okay. All assistant directors really want to be directors. Uh, the, the assistant director. <laughs> One guy said to me, employed. <laughs> That's true, <it>, yeah. <laughs> right? Okay. All stunt coordinators want to really be. Ooh, all stunt coordinators want to be loved. <laughs> <laughs> like, what are you making me do? That hurts. <laughs> Okay. Uh, all fight choreographers want to really be stunt coordinators. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. And finally, remember they want their choreography to be remembered. Okay. Um, all directors want to really be what? Uh, they want to be. They want to be at number one in Hollywood. I would think. And all producers. Number one. I mean, that's your goal when you're a director or producer is to be the best you can be, you know. Mm. Okay. Um, so, okay. So now, now I, I, so when I was, again, doing my extensive research on you. Okay. Right. Um, I came across this thing. It's, it, it, it varies because some say there are nine female character archetypes with male counterparts. And then a, there's, there's not, wait, say it again. There's not there, what? There are nine female character archetypes. Okay. And then they're also, and then they have male counterparts. Okay. Right. But then there was another section that said that you can have the, um, the female as a heroine, but also as a villain. Hmm. Yeah. Are, are we talking screenwriting? Is this what we're discussing? I think that's what they were talking about. Okay. So I wanted to ask you, as a writer, is is that, I mean, is that even true? Is, is that how people approach what they're doing? There are types, that's for sure, like, you know, well, it's interesting, like, when you're talking Hollywood, there are types they look for and they try to balance it out. I can't tell you how many times you hear people say, oh, I read a script and almost all the characters sound the same. They have the same voice. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, so that's uh, one thing that always has come up all the time on, on my, my radar. Right. Um, you know, and then if you study comedy, there are also you know, especially going back even to the days of, you know, uh, you know, ancient Greece and, and also um, comedy as it was developing in Europe. Um, I took a course with Steve Kaplan a few times and we, he talks about the different kinds of comedy characters that come up, you know, whether it could be the, you know, the, the aging old man and they're all kind of different. And then, you know, the young, you yeah. know, yeah. Man, you know, so there, there are these types but that inevitably evolved. Um, I like this one gentleman that I studied with named Sam Christensen and because he was a casting director in Hollywood. He used to actually cast for MASH, the TV show. And he says, if you look at, um, you know, uh, the people that we have that are stars today, they really almost have a line back to almost greek mythology and greek gods and we just kind of recreate them over and over with a little spin yeah so, so that's why sometimes you can be the most amazing most powerful actor in hollywood but if you don't fit into this type that uh we tell in our stories because stories we've been telling stories throughout the ages right, right? yeah you know, you have the hero you have the damsel you might have the strong goddess type uh you have the voluptuous type, we have the, the devilish type, you know. I mean, you can look back to old mythology, Greek mythology, and we, we that's, use these characters. That's what, I that's what I found. So, for example, um, there is Aphrodite, the seductive muse. Yeah. And who's right? That? Pamela Anderson, right? Yeah. But then the villainous version 
is the femme fatale. Right. Right. Then there's Artemis, the Amazon, a powerful, independent woman who loves competition. Yeah. But then the villain is the Gorgon, a vengeful woman. Yeah. Yeah. Right. That's so, yeah, I, I look at Hunter Games. You're meeting Angelina Jolie, you know, a tombstone, uh, you know, tomb, tomb Raider, excuse me. Um, yeah. Yeah. All these different, you know. Hey, who, who would play you? Who would play you in a movie? You mean Way the Cowboy? No, you well, girl. <laughs> I mean, you know, if they were making a movie about you, who would play you? Oh, wow. Um, Personality-wise, of actresses that I've seen out there, Olivia Munn. I, oh, I actually, that's her, true. That's Olivia true. Munn. When I listen to her... Yeah, that's her family life. I'm like, oh my god, that's kind of similar to me. You know? I can see that. Yeah. I can see that. Yeah. Um. So, do you? It's not possible for somebody like you with your background to have a favorite movie, is it? Is it? Oh no, I have a lot of favorite movies, but I, I have favorite movies in different genres. Right. That's yeah. Movie. Um, um, I, it might surprise people. I I love musicals. I love West Side Story. I really do. <laughs> well, I got I got a sense of that because of your work, but I forget what it was. But your work in theater. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I have a strong theater background. Yeah. Ah, but didn't you do? Oh, yeah. Did you do choreography for theater also? I did. I was asked later on um, to do choreography. Both Ron and I, jo you know, Ron joined me at East West Players, which is the preeminent, uh, the first Asian American theater company established in the country by Mako back in the 1960s. And wow. so uh, my, my aunt, my dad's sister, had been involved with East West Players a long time ago. Um, and then, of course, you know, a lot of the people my father worked with also were connected, uh, like Mako and I think Pat Morita, and um, so yeah, East West players. Okay. Yeah. Um, what? And Lodestone Theater Company, which was more of a, a smaller yeah. independent group, was also um, a group that I got involved with a long time ago and did plays and you know we did you know different things, projects and yeah, I, I love theater. Did um. Did, did you go to school for any of this? I, in college, I studied uh, theater as well. Okay. And, then, and then I would also, uh, when I was going to auditions as an actress, I was studying with Michael Shortliff, who wrote the book, How to Audition. And uh, Michael Shortliff, at the time, people would say that he wrote the, the Bible on acting. Uh, and he actually helped uh, discover Dustin Hoffman. So mm -hmm. he was my teacher on and off for about, I would say two years and then um, another Broadway casting director who was amazing named Ginger Friedman. Right. Also, wow, so. um, since, since we're talking about school, your, your film, The Sensei, ended up being used to teach about bullying in school. Yeah. yeah. How, how did you handle bullying in school? Ooh, uh, that's an interesting, uh, question um for me personally because um you know there's different forms of bullying mm -hmm. there's the kind that can be physical and then there's the kind that can be psychological yeah and sometimes it's the ones that are psychological i i kind of feel can sometimes really um you know hurt the most and, and sometimes can be the most endearing i mean i'm not endearing uh enduring because it it, 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 it there's sometimes um, it, I remember in junior high school, let's just say, long story short, I had went through something and I was 12 or 13. And um, anyway, it, it got around that somehow I was a slut or that I was a whore. Now you imagine you're a 12 year old girl, you don't even understand this, you know, yeah. and, and then you're seeing your name on, you know, a bathroom stall. I, I can't even imagine being a preteen or even a teenager in this social media age, yeah. because I know that would have ended up on Twitter or Facebook or Instagram. Yeah. 
I, I can imagine the kind of pressure uh, young people have to, in this day and age. And I just remember how much that hurt and how much I felt like I had to work so hard at trying to uh, keep and maintain or reclaim some reputation out there, you know, and it's, I'm a little girl. So, yeah. um, and so for me, my, my, my ability to get through some of these dark times was really my faith because my grandparents were people of the faith. And, and uh, I just tried really hard uh, to be kind to people and good to people and hope that that would leave a, a, an impression of who I am. And, you know, I could just get over this, this obstacle. Yeah. Uh, you know, I've been bullied in elementary school. I had kids being physical with me and I thought, you know, but it's, it's different when it's psychological and when it, it, it attacks your character and your, you know, and who you are as a person. And, um, so yeah, uh, bullying is a tough one. And for me, like when I wrote the sensei, you start to see in a way where I, for me as a martial arts teacher, now I'm going to go into those roots now, because when I wasn't working in Hollywood, guess what? what I did to survive. Some people waited tables. Mm -hmm. I taught martial arts. That's yeah. how I made my living, both Ron and I. Yeah. I was amazed in my travels across the country that there were martial arts schools that could not even open their door to people that were gay or trans. Number one, because either they didn't feel comfortable with it, or number two, they were afraid of retali uh, retaliation from the community and losing business. And I'm thought, Oh my gosh, you know, and at that time it was around 2003, 2002, I, um, you know, and it's way after the whole Matthew Shepard case. It, do you remember the Matthew Shepard case where yeah, he was I, in? I, yes, and I know a little bit about well, it, yeah. And, you know, I have gay family members, and I just thought, I can't believe this is going on in my own martial arts community. And to me, it was one of, I know already what it is to be a child that was, you know, half white and half Asian. I know yep. what it's like to live in a country at the time, because when I was born, California was one of the few states that allowed for uh, interracial marriage. Um, it had my parents move to another state, their marriage, just as it would have been for, you know, African-American white couples, it, their marriage was also considered illegal. Right. And it wasn't until, you know, Loving versus Virginia that the ban on, on, you know, interracial marriage was lifted. So I know what that feels like to walk into a restaurant and have people disapprove of your family or who you are. And, yeah. and, and so that's, to me, a, another form of society bullying you or bullying a family or bullying somebody because they're, they're different. And that's why um, I felt compelled as an artist to address it, you know, kind of like the art of fighting without fighting, you know what yeah. I mean? Um, that's the only way I knew how to kind of have a voice about this was through art. I, I, I just realized that your dad and Uncle Bruce had that in common. Yes, they did. mixed marriage. Yeah, they both had Caucasian women as their yeah. wives. Yeah. Uh, and that's probably one of the reasons why I have such um, warm uh, memories as well as a child because I didn't see a lot of children like me except Brandon. Brandon and I were nearly the same age. He was a, a little bit older than me by one year or 10 months or something like that. Mm -hmm. And and you're talking 60s, early 70s. And so when we were with Uncle Bruce, you know, when we were with, you know, um, you know, Aunt Linda and the whole martial arts, you know, nexus, I felt safe. I felt good in this world. You know, um, it wasn't until we would go out and go to restaurants or something, you you know, and, and we're also talking uh, the Vietnam War was still going on. And um, it, was, it, was, it, was a, it was a really tough period. And um, I never forgot that. It, it, it really shaped who I would become. And, and, and then you grow up and you end up working in this industry where there is also bullying. Oh, yeah. Oh, sure. Absolutely. Right. Um, oh, absolutely. Uh, like I said, I was mentioning the Me Too movement. And, um, you know, I, I can't tell you ugh, the crap that guys would try, try to get away with just saying things because maybe they were up on the higher chain of the production team. Yeah. And I remember as an extra, 
you know, because uh, I wanted to get and break into this industry without my dad's help. A lot of people are under the notion that my dad helped me. I did it all on my own. You know, if somebody happened to ask and maybe was familiar with martial arts, then they might recognize my name. But honestly, I, I did it on my own. And, um, but I was stunned how um, it was so easy for, for guys to just do things to you, grab you or mock you or say sexual jokes. And you didn't have anywhere to turn. You didn't have no place to say, help me somebody, this guy's being an asshole, you know? Yeah. And yeah. if you don't say something, you might lose your job, you know? Or you might get, you know, you know, you know, blacklisted or whatever, you know. And, um, you know, so I saw some abuse on the set, including with myself, but it's so funny. I'll, I'll never, uh, I'll, I'm going to tell the story. Um, one time I had to body double this one woman um, and it was a second unit crew. Um, and it was some show that, it was Jim Belushi's show. I can't remember what it was, what the name of it was. He was playing detective. I, Jim Belushi wasn't there. Not, yeah, Jim Belushi show. But I was with, their second unit crew and they were having to match up some scene where this girl is doing this provocative dance and um and i felt awkward because i had to wear this really i was like 19 at the time and i had to wear this really sexy outfit and wear this tiki head necklace and they had to get a close-up of of this necklace mm -hmm. and, and they and they turned off the lights and i had to kind of move and it was a little too dark and i felt really strange like I don't, this doesn't feel right to me. And then they were making jokes. And I'll, ne I'll never forget this one guy going, oh yeah, she likes to give a little head. Ah, and everybody's laughing. And I'm the only one not laughing. It's me and three got men, you know? And I didn't know what to do. So the lights turn on. And, um, and I remember somebody said something and asked me about my background somehow. And I mentioned that I knew Jeff Amata and that he was like a brother to me. And all of a sudden the room goes quiet. Ha. Just silence. Now, I'm, a, I'm still a teenager. I'm still like 18, 19. And all of a sudden, they all shifted gears. And all of a sudden, started to go, I'm going to put on my halo. Now, all of a sudden, they're talking respectfully yes. to me. Yeah. And then I mentioned who my dad was. Because yeah. that's how I knew Jeff Amata. And that my dad was Dan Osano. And... All of a sudden, they were really being super nice to me. And, oh, yeah, we worked with Jeff. And they were afraid. But I'm like, and, and it occurred to me, like, geez. I, I mean, it shouldn't take me being the daughter of a well-known martial arts family or from a well-known martial arts circle to make these guys straighten up. And that's why I feel guys will, tr there are some people that will try to, <sighs> get away with what they can get away mm -hmm. you know what i mean and, yeah. and and i'll never forget that moment you know so well, i i i'd have to confess that um i dropped your dad's name um but it wasn't my fault all right <laughs> Why did you drop dad's name because because so it was 1993 on the set of only the strong okay and you know martin de cascos shows up and yeah. so everybody is in awe of the lead and what have you. And he comes around and he's introducing himself to everybody. I was the only one who had a story. I oh. said, I go, Mark, do you remember in 1985, you were supposed to go down to Trinidad to do a demonstration with your father's students? He goes, yeah. He goes, yeah, Dan Inasano was going to be there. I go, yes, Dan Inasano has been my instructor since 1983. That was it. I was in. I was in. Oh, wow. Oh, that is not funny. <laughs> right? But the, but the truth of it is that I did go, I go, I went down to Trinidad with Sifu Dan and Chris Kent. That's right. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, I right? remember my so, dad So, you know. Yeah. So I tell it's not my fault that I'm connected. <laughs> that's funny. Oh my God, that's really funny. Right? Um, so tell me a little bit about the biggest transition or, or the, the biggest adjustment from in front of the camera to behind the camera. 
the biggest adjustment uh, for me, because I, I was wearing uh, many hats, it was being responsible for all these people and, and making sure that, um, that you, cause there's a lot, sometimes if personalities are not carefully matched, um, <laughs> and sometimes you have no ability to, um, hire everybody, you know, sometimes you're not always in charge of everybody. And so when all these people gather, you know, you never know what's going to happen if people are going to get along, you know, you hope that people can. Um, but it's, it's learning to manage uh, personalities. It's learning to manage conflict that does happen because it, nothing ever works out exactly the way you expect it when you're on a set. Yeah. Um, but on the other hand, there was something uh, refreshing and amazing about being able to just have the power to tell a story and not have, uh, you know, uh, rules about whether or not, you know, um, you know, how things are supposed to be because there was a there was a time when we were filming the sensei and part of our we lost part of our budget there was an investor that pulled out and we were already on set and it was terrifying um to to me uh, on, on the other hand you know um you know i had no problem investing my own money in my project because it was an indie film mm -hmm. but it was about getting to the end but it was a weird, it was a great learning experience for me because you start to see on a business level how money works. So there were different people we went to that were already established in the business and I won't name who they were, but oh my God, they were gonna try to take my project and turn it into this, what I call, not an indie film, but what I call this, this flavor that was very low budget, kind of chop socky, no, no, no respect for story, no respect right. for character. Because of, because, I, I, of who, because of who you are. Yeah, or, or because of who they were, because they had maybe worked with my, my godfather or other people, and I hated it the way they were treating me, almost like I was a child. And I thought, I'd rather have the money run out, and I'll try to just reestablish funding it again, I, mm -hmm. um, and which is what I had to do, you know. Um, but I was, that's the one thing I was amazed at, especially being, um, you know, as a, as a woman, having people tell me how I was going to need to do this, this, and this, and this, and kind of pretty much drop my vision. And had I listened to them, I mean, I don't think I would have ever had the course and, and the path that I've had from that moment on when I, you know, when I was filming and, and being able to meet and go to Washington, D.C., meet people in Congress, having people like John Lewis say, thank you for making your movie. This is before the Hate Crimes Bill Act. I mean, uh, you know, I am just so glad that I just stuck to my guns about the vision of my movie. As small budget as it was, it had an important message. Um, before the Hate Crimes Bill Act was uh, signed by President Obama, um, we were on their website and they were recommending my movie along with Laramie Project and Boys Don't Cry. And it was just amazing all the political people that do pay attention to these movies because yeah. they you know, the, the Hate Crimes Bill Act was a very important bill. And it was a bipartisan bill. I, I want to add that, too. I don't want people to say, oh, it's a liberal thing. I'm like, no, this was a bipartisan bill. And by uh, Senator Gordon Smith, a Republican, who uh, sadly had lost his son, who committed suicide. And he started learning about the high suicide rate of gay teenagers. And he ended up joining forces with Judy Shepard, who was Matthew Shepard's mother. And um, somehow they got connected with Senator Ted Kennedy. Um, this is when you know Senator Kennedy was still alive, and um, put out this bill. And 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 it was such an important bill. And I'm just glad that you know my movie could be kind of connected within these. With all that, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, the biggest impactful difference between independent filmmaking and something backed by the studio budget. Budget. Well, stu studios, okay, for you talking studios or studio-like productions with multi-million dollars and no. producers like, you know, like for instance, Way of the Cowboy, I feel so honored that uh, Mark Gordon has taken this project. I mean, this is the man that did Saving Private Ryan with wow. Steven Spielberg. 
and yeah. he's He's taking this project about my dad and the Cowboys underneath his wing with Matt Jackson. I mean, hallelujah. <laughs> oh my God, hallelujah. Um, I'm just, I'm, I'm just honored. Um, so, so, but that, that's studio level. And then yes. there's, you know, the sensei, which was indie level where I'm, you know, asking people for, you know, do you want to be an investor? And I'm putting in my own money and, uh, and then there's the, your, what I call the quick, I call them quick budget films, I guess. That's my own terminology. And, you know, that might be something like that might look like a, a, a Don Dragon uh, Wilson film or Cynthia Rock Rock, where it's like a Hong Kong movie. So there's different kinds of, um, you know, movies. And yeah. in, now in this, since this post recessionary era, it's, it's even more becoming more different with Netflix and Hulu and you know China becoming a force in in, in, in cinema. So it's 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 a, it's a different world right now. Really yeah, is is that world is that world of movie making that um, not waiting for the studio to fund your project? Right? Is that a, a metaphor for life? Yeah, I think so. I mean, listen, that's what my godfather did. I mean, you don't have any amazing projects my my godfather uh, was trying to produce. I mean, come on, come fu, you know? I mean, it's such a, a great premise, and they took that away from him. You know, how devastating. I, I can't imagine how devastating that must have been. And But I think it's also amazing that he wasn't going to be devastated by it. In fact, you know, listening to Shannon talk about this and, and Linda, and, and the, you know, and, and even my mom talked about that because she remembers when Uncle Bruce said, you know, I'll just, I'll make my own way. And, and he went to Hong Kong and, and, and the rest is history, you know, and he teamed up with people there and, and, and he revolutionized the whole Hong Kong uh, um, filmmaking industry there. And I, I don't care what anybody says, you know, people always talk about my godfather being this amazing action martial arts star, but I think he is also one of the, one of the greatest pioneers in indie filmmaking. I mean, he was an independent filmmaker and he wrote his stuff. He got together and they directed and produced. I mean, yeah. without the big studios, you yeah. know, or into yeah. the Okay. I'm going to start, uh, I'm going to start wrapping this up. Sure. Um, actually, let me wrap it up with this. Who's your biggest fan? Yeah. Um, oh, I think my husband is. Does he count? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. I have no idea. I'm not I sure. saw. I saw the clip of you on set with Danny Trejo. <gasps> um, the face oh. time with Sebastian. Oh Sebastian. my God. I love Danny Trejo. I love Machete. <laughs> yeah. yeah, he. Um, for for people out there who don't know, I, my oldest son uh, has autism, and uh, and he's been participating in the Special Olympics. And it was so interesting that by accident, um, I had found out that Danny has, I guess, two two stepsons with autism, and so he's done a lot of work with this community. Yeah. And so when he heard, because I, I was just trying to get an autograph, you know, for my son, we'll do more than that. Get your face, you know, get your FaceTime or whatever, or whatever. And come on, we're going to go on with, with your son right now, right now. I'm like, now? <laughs> and that's where you saw that video yeah. clip. That's, Dan, that's Danny Trejo doing that. And um, oh my God, that was just such a, a, an amazing moment for, for my kid. I, I just, yeah, I, I love Danny for doing that. Yeah. Well, listen, this has been an amazing moment for me. Oh, thanks. Tony. Thank you so much. Right. I, I really, I really appreciate your taking some time out on a Friday evening to do this. And uh, well, I'm not going to pressure you, but I'd like for you to come back sometime because I'll confess my intention was to talk to you for as long as I could okay. without making it all about kicking and punching. <laughs> I appreciate that. <laughs> you know, I love kicking and punch, but I appreciate that. Yeah, um, you know, I mean, because as important as that is to our lives, one of the things that I'm trying to do with the dialogues is to show people the, the, the vast expanse of character that we have 
in the JKD world. Yeah. Oh, you know, yeah. it's not all just pox out, lops out. You know, I mean, come on. Yeah, no, it's, it, that's so true. I mean, I, I tell people all the time that I use martial arts every day it, in my work. It's not just about hitting, kicking and, you know, you know, safety on the streets. It's also being able to prepare yourself and it gives you a certain internal strength, like when you're in difficult situations and how to stay calm and, and problem solve. Yeah, I, 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 I use it all the time and I'm grateful uh, for that in my history and it's my heritage and um, I love my, my dad for that. Um, and I love uh, that he gave me the confidence to where I can walk in any room and I feel yeah. I, can, I can take it on, you know? And okay, last thing. Suggestions for people that I should ask to come on to the show. Ooh, uh, Gracia Garcia. She was my other role model growing up. Yeah. She would be my, um, I would say her. I would, because she was one of the, the earliest female uh, pioneers of martial artists when there were no other female. Well, martial I, I did reach out, but she has no idea who I am, so I haven't heard back from her. Well, I will connect you. And then the other one, uh, Lucia Riker, you know, Lady Tyson. Uh huh. She was uh, in Clint's movie, Million Dollar Baby. Okay. She's an interesting woman to talk to. Next, uh, next Friday, um, Eleanor Academia Magda is coming on. Oh, wonderful. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, but uh, yeah, but if if you could do that Graciela thing, because that'd yeah. be the bomb. Absolutely. I yeah. Will that. It will be my pleasure. All right. Okay. Listen. Thank you so much. Thank right. You. Right. Give up, give everybody my best regards and I'll see you soon. Okay, I'll see you soon. Okay, right. take care. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Bye.